Well, welcome to our service again on this Sunday, and let's join together in words of worship. God has called us here to worship. All, All the world, world, give God, God your praises. praises. Let us thank him for his goodness. All, All the world, world, give God, God your praises. praises. Let us ask him to forgive us. All, All the world, world, give God, God your praises. praises. Let us learn what he would teach us. All, All the world, world, give God, God your praises. praises. Let us bring our prayers before him. All, All the world, world, give God, God your praises. praises. Shout for joy to the God who loves us. Glory, Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Well, our first hymn is Bless the Lord, O My Soul, and it's a song in which we pledge to keep faithful to God, whatever the circumstances. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh, oh, my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. Sing your song again Whatever 
a summary of why we're gathered for this service leading into our confession. We come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image, to the praise and glory of his name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, for, for he, he has heard, heard the voice of our prayer. prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and, and in, in our song will we praise our God. Well, the reason that we can receive that forgiveness from God is because of what Jesus did when he died for us on the cross. And that's reflected in our next song, Worthy is the Lamb, which expresses our thanks to God for this rescue. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the bride. Bearing all my sin and shame In love you came And gave amazing grace Thank you for this love, Lord Thank you for the nail-pierced hands Wash me in your cleansing flow Now all I know Forgiveness and
Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Well, it's Tim Davis's turn to speak to us on this Sunday about why he is still a Christian. And uh, Tim has chosen a couple of Bible readings and they're going to be read to us now. The first one comes from Katie Lofman. Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Saviour. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Thank you very much, Katie. Nathan Larkin, our youth minister, is going to read the second of our readings. Romans chapter 4. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised? or also for the uncircumcised. We've been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then, he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised, in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is then also the father of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the world, but through righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed, and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. 
Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. Being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised, and this is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. why I am still a Christian. Why do I feel like I've done this before? Uh, perhaps it's because I've delivered a why I am a Christian talk twice at Christchurch and the second time I made the point that the talk should probably be entitled why I am still a Christian but I didn't really change much at all of my first talk the second time around and I guess it was because if I had to think about it then the sermon would probably be a fairly brief five word talk. Why I am still a Christian I don't know, just am. Not the most inspiring talk, agreed. So I decided I'd take the approach I used to my Why I Am Christian talk and to find out why I am still a Christian, change the wording and ask myself the question, why am I still a Christian? I still don't know, I just am. One of the things I've learned over the years is that when you answer a question with a slightly evasive non-response, it's usually because the real answer is somewhat uncomfortable to seek out. You know, what, if, what if the answer isn't one that Stephen would approve of being shared with you all? Am I just going through the motions? Have I been ignoring everything around me, not questioning my faith? Because you know, when you stop and think about it, Everything's going wrong in the world. Everything's, everything's rubbish. I have, to, I have to work at home and I don't get out and see people. My holiday's been cancelled. I've been stressed and ill and lethargic and my couch to 5k plans at the start of lockdown never got beyond week three and there's so much bad stuff going on in the world that I can't stand to hear about it anymore. And God really doesn't seem to be doing anything about it. And he certainly doesn't seem to be a massive presence in my life right now. And if I'm perfectly honest, the stress of constantly trying to do good Christian things is getting too much. And I wonder if I feel I'd be better off just forgetting it all. And so I can't help but ask myself, Myself, why am I still a Christian? Does anyone else find themselves asking that at times? It's not like that all the time, is it? But sometimes being a Christian is not something I find easy. I can find myself caught between days of it being the best thing in the world and times when it's a source of just angst and stress. But as I've thought more on this, I've found myself actually really appreciating why I still am a Christian. And also realised that two members of our church, John and Helen Cook, have something to do with it as well. Psalm 24 is my favourite of the Psalms. It's a hymn of praise to God that tells a story, our story. And I like it because it's short, straightforward, but also challenging story. Everything you need to know is contained within it. I'm just going to focus on the first few verses, really. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. God made us. God created the world and set in motion everything that would lead to our creation and the creation of everything that is to come. God created us. We owe him honour and respect, and yet being in a position to give him this presents us with a problem. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Me? You? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. Can any of us claim to have pure hearts, never devoting our attention to other things when we should have been devoted to God alone? To describe ourselves as pure of heart is hard, if we're really honest. 
And it certainly feels that way to me a lot of the time. This acknowledgement that I'm not pure of heart, with clean hands, is difficult. I've often given myself a hard time and wrestled with this. Am I a Christian? Yes. Do I think I am worthy to ascend the hill of the Lord? I guess so. If I was to truly allow God to examine my heart and mind, to open myself up to a real, honest, no secrets are hidden examination of myself and see an account of what I've done wrong just this past week, let alone my lifetime, would I meet the criteria? Because I don't think regular use of hand sanitizer counts for the clean hands but and right there in that moment I find myself thinking back to my second year of secondary school John Cook was my second year form master when I was at school and he also taught me history for the first two years at secondary school and it was in his history lessons that I first learned about the Reformation and Martin Luther now, 30 odd years later, I don't remember much from my history lessons. Sorry, John. Uh, but I always remembered learning about how much Martin Luther struggled with this same idea, and particularly the righteousness of God. For Luther, he understood God as the only truly righteous concept. And if God was righteous, then he would punish the unjust and the sinners. But you know, what about the Christians, the good guys? Luther was a monk. He devoted his life to living a pure and holy life. And yet he knew that if God were to examine his heart and mind, then he too would be punished by a righteous God. Because he knew that in contrast to God, he, Martin Luther, was still just a sinner. And I can identify with that so much of the time. I, I want to be able to say, look, God, I'm doing all these things for you. I'm living my life as a Christian. Is this OK? Is this enough? And when I do that, I know deep down that it's not. My hands are not clean. My heart is not pure. And I can start to beat myself up internally about it all. Luther did the same thing until he started to really study and understand Paul's letter to the Romans, in particular one and a half verses from Romans chapter 3. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Luther had been so focused on the law and doing good, continuous acts that would still never be sufficient to make him righteous before God. But after years of much prayer, meditation and struggle, Luther finally discovered the true meaning of God's word. Then finally, God had mercy on me, and I began to understand that the righteousness of God is a gift of God by which a righteous man lives, namely faith. And that sentence, the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, is passive, indicating that the merciful God justifies us by faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now I felt as though I had been reborn altogether and had entered paradise. It's not about what we do. It's, it's never been about that exclusively. It's, it's about God. I can't make myself righteous before God. I can't ascend the hell of the Lord with clean hands and a pure, pure heart through any endeavours of my own. But I will because my righteousness is a gift from God. I am made righteous through the death of Jesus Christ, taking my punishment for sin, making me clean and pure and righteous. And it came as a gift from God. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, 
who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Saviour, such as the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. I receive the blessing from God my Saviour, and it's God my Saviour with his gift to me, to all of us, of forgiveness and salvation and grace and righteousness that enables me, all of us, to be welcomed into his presence. I'm still a Christian because when I find myself beating myself up about not being a good person, I then remember that I've been given the greatest gift possible, the impossible made possible, forgiveness of sins and all I had to do was say sorry why would I turn away from that in the next chapter of Romans which we heard read a moment ago Paul goes on to explain to the readers that it's all about faith unless you believe in Jesus Christ then you have nothing because you cannot receive salvation through your own works and he cites Abraham as an example of someone who, despite his incredible life and actions, becoming the father of all nations, was justified and made righteous not by his works, but by his faith. And he's an inspiration and encouragement to me, because it's really important to why I still am a Christian. That I understand that my life is not mine to know in full already. Abraham lived a long life. He had obeyed God. He travelled far and wide. He had to wait until he was 100 before having the son he so longed for. And there was still so much more to come for him. Life is full of surprises. And it's only when we're able to see the full picture that we fully understand. Now, Helen Cook, or Miss Newton, as she was, new, as she was known then, was my maths teacher for three years at secondary school. Now, 30 odd years later, I don't remember much of my maths lessons. Sorry, Helen. Uh, but I always remembered at the end of term one year, um, Miss Newton introducing us to these puzzles called nonograms, picture puzzles that you completed by using numbers to determine which squares were blank and which were to be filled in. And I really enjoyed doing these puzzles, these grids, that Miss Newton had photocopied from a newspaper. And later on in life, I discovered that the people that people now produce these puzzles online, uh, except they called them griddlers and made these massive multi-picture ones as well. And this is what it would look like. Uh, if you're seeing this online, on the left is uh, the blank picture with none of the puzzles completed yet. And on the right is the first one of them uh, ready to be tackled. Now we see the puzzle partially completed and then finally finished. And you can see sort of coloured in the lines, depending on where the numbers were and how they corresponded on the X and Y axis. Uh, and it looks slightly odd. You know, it's this weird little mixture of shapes and colours, perhaps not making any sense. But that's because it's just one part of the bigger picture. Gradually, I'd complete more of the puzzle squares. Some squares were quick and easy to complete. Others were complicated and hard. Often I needed to try and work out the problem in the puzzle through trial and error. I might get stuck and not find it particularly enjoyable. It would frustrate, but I'd be glad when a puzzle was completed. But it was only when I'd completed the last puzzle that I'd be able to see how the different pieces came together to show the whole picture. In this instance, a nice seaside scene. And life for me often feels like that. Not like a seaside, but a multi-puzzle nonogram. And it's why I remember that I need to have faith in God continuously. I don't know everything that's going to happen to me. I look back on my life so far and I'm amazed at everything that's happened to me. Just picture your life as one of those nonograms or griddlers, multi-puzzles. But with each square representing a moment from your life like a picture collage gradually being added to. For me, I'd see school, family, work, marriage, becoming a lay minister, but there'd be still, hopefully, 
a great many squares yet to be revealed. Abraham longed for a son and thought he was too old for one. But he had faith in God. And it was only when he could look back on his whole life that he could see just how amazing it was, including being a father, and that his was a life lived by faith rather than by what he thought he could accomplish on his own. But at the end of it, it was still all about what God had promised him was still to come than what he had experienced in his rich, long life. And that is an encouragement to me in my faith and part of the reason why I am still a Christian. I see the great picture developing before me, and yet I'm excited by what's still to come. And I know that I'm only fully going to understand it all at the end. I am still a Christian, but not because of what I think God has done in my life. You know, there was no deal made that if he provided me with A, B or C or helped me with X, Y or Z, that I would in turn remain a Christian. No, I'm still a Christian because of the one-time deal that God set up for me nearly 2,000 years before I was born. I'm a Christian because of a gift from God. His forgiveness his grace, his salvation, his righteousness that he has then bestowed on me and you, giving us clean hands and pure hearts once again so that we can live by faith in him, assured of eternity to come. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tim, uh, for speaking to us uh, on this Sunday about why you're still a Christian. And thanks also uh, for everything that you uh, do for Christchurch through your ministry and, of course, that of the other readers, uh, Katie and Becky, as well. Becky Mills is now going to lead us in our prayers. Lord God, we thank you that through Jesus' death and resurrection, you displayed your covenant faithfulness to all of humanity and to all of creation. We thank you that through the faithfulness of Jesus, his faithful life and his obedient death, we've been rescued, restored, forgiven. We thank you with all our hearts that when we confess with our lips that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe that you raised him from the dead, we are radically redefined and transformed. Your gift is that we're your renewed people. And through us, you will be putting your world to rights and we will reign with Jesus in the kingdom of God. Though we are frail and feel like we fail constantly, help us never to forget what we've been saved for. Give us the grace to live a life of loyalty and faithfulness as demonstrated by Jesus. Loving God, we pray for our world as we move through more loss of life more recoveries and more challenging conversations around COVID-19. This week, we remember particularly those working with coronavirus in the UK, India, the United States, Brazil, Russia and South Africa. Teach us how to live and move and have our being as your people, bound up with each other and wholly dependent upon you. Reveal your loving presence to those who are grieving or anxious in social isolation. Guide each of us towards a fuller understanding of this disease and our interdependence with all of creation. Lord God, we pray that all our actions to combat climate change and care for your world earlier on in the year will not be forgotten and that we'll continue to act wisely and responsibly to preserve the beauty of the natural world and the vast and delicate balance of your ecosystem. Help us to be constantly aware of our own carbon footprint and ways of minimising it. Inspire us to refuse non-essential flights, reduce our personal fuel use and rethink all our options for remote working. Keep that vision of a new heaven and new earth before us and our calling to be agents of your magnificent and amazing renewal 
of the created order. This week, we pray for those in Belarus, Hong Kong. We thank you for those who have courageously opposed autocratic rule, corruption and poverty, lack of opportunity and low pay. Bring hope to the people there who are victims of political oppression and imprudent governance. We pray that you would teach all to walk the path of justice with wisdom and compassion. We pray for Beirut, Lebanon and all Lebanese people as their communities are convulsed by the after effects of the ammonium nitrate explosion, changing the lives of families and individuals forever. Hold the people close to you through their devastation. Guide all government action through this terrible catastrophe. Bind up the brokenhearted and give strength to the rescue workers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In all these things, we are so aware that we're finite creatures dependent on your sovereign goodness. In all these moments, we place ourselves back into your arms of mercy and grace. Show us how to delight in what is good, to confront what is evil, to heal what is damaging. Give to us a discerning strength to move into the next moment, the next day, the next act of compassion and courage. We remember all those who are ill at Christchurch. We thank you that Frank Dobson's shingles are improving, but we pray that the cause of his constant feelings of sickness will be identified and properly treated. We remember Valerie Perry in hospital and pray that some light might be shed on the reasons for her falls that she's experiencing of late. We remember Valerie Johnson and thank you that she's comfortable in respite care. We pray that everyone who's struggling will feel surrounded by the loving support of family and friends. Now the lifting of restrictions has made this much easier to achieve. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, ruler of the world. Amen. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Well, thank you very much, Becky. Our final hymn is Man of Sorrows. And it's a song which again reflects that great act of rescue that took place for us when Jesus died on the cross.
Well, for those listening on CD, chapter 12 of Neil Garton follows immediately after this service. It's the most dramatic chapter in the book, so have a hanky ready. Uh, it's pretty gripping stuff, and uh, if anyone else uh, wants to hear that, then let me know. We're going to finish our service now with a final prayer of blessing. Be with us, O God, as we go out in your name. May the lips that have sung your praises always speak the truth. May the ears which have heard your word listen only to what is good. And may our lives, as well as our worship, be always pleasing to you. For the glory of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Christ church, Christ church, Christ church, you more than Oh yeah.